If it's Thursday, top Republicans and presidential frontrunners set their sights on a new wave of culture wars, targeting the classroom, Congress, corporations, even your cooktop, as the party sets a course for 2024 and beyond. Plus, what now for police reform as the nation mourns the loss of Tyree Nichols? President Biden holds talks with black lawmakers who are pushing the administration to take action now. And combating America's housing crisis for an estimated 600,000 homeless people in America. I want to talk to the White House official who's been tasked with dramatically reversing those numbers within just two years. Thursday and welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd reporting from Washington. Right now, we appear to be at the very start of a what appears to be a new political arms race among prominent conservatives and prospective Republican presidential candidates as they try to unite the conservative party around some peculiar and at times unsettling debates about everything from gas stoves to transgender rights. I'm talking, of course, about the conservative culture wars, which are being turbocharged thanks to the presidential campaign. Take a look at the Republican field's two 2024 frontrunners right now, Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis. Just this week, former President Trump said that a new Trump administration would punish doctors who provide gender-affirming care to minors, and would also have the, seek to have the government only recognize gender assigned at birth, essentially banning trans individuals. He's also proposed an education plan that would cut federal funding for any school that teaches critical race theory, however that's defined, or gender ideology. And he wants to eliminate teacher tenure. As for Governor DeSantis, he's focusing much of his culture wars on the classroom. Last month, he blocked the College Board's AP African American Studies course in Florida, claiming it was inaccurate and that it lacked educational value. That course curriculum has been overhauled. We'll see if he signs off on it. Last year, he signed the, quote, Stop Woke Act, which restricts certain race-based conversations in schools and businesses. The law has been the subject uh, of a number of legal challenges. And to be sure, DeSantis is also pouncing on this week's culture war buzzword of the moment, announcing a new policy to encourage Floridians to buy gas stoves, which have quickly become a cultural symbol of defiance against liberals. They want to control every single aspect of your life. They want to be able to determine what type of energy you're allowed to use, how much energy you're allowed to use. And so this is all part uh, of a larger scheme. And so I think in the state of Florida, uh, we're saying, you know, don't tread on us on this. We're going to stand for people's freedoms. We're still trying to figure out what the scheme is. Another prospective Republican presidential candidate, former Secretary of State and CIA Director Mike Pompeo, recently characterized the head of the American Federation of Teachers, Randy Weingarten, as literally the most dangerous person in the world. He used that phrase. Here in Washington, Florida Senator Marco Rubio today reintroduced a buffet of bills that he calls the, quote, anti-woke agenda that, among other things, would eliminate the position of chief diversity officer inside the Defense Department, and in his words, enable shareholders to hold woke corporations accountable. And the first mobilization of the House Republican majority's whip operation was not for a border bill or for an inflation measure, but it was for a vote to boot a member of the squad, Ilan Omar, off the House Foreign Relations Committee. Here's Omar pushing back on the House floor today. I am Muslim. I am an immigrant, and interestingly, from Africa. Is anyone surprised that I am being targeted? Is anyone surprised that I am somehow deemed unworthy to speak about American foreign policy? Or that they see me as a powerful voice that needs to be silenced? Frankly, it is expected. Because when you push power, power pushes back. Folks, to win a Republican primary these days, particularly a presidential primary, it appears you don't have to have a foreign policy doctrine. You don't have to have a program of fiscal stability, a big tax plan, debating marginal tax rates. You probably simply need to portray yourself as the biggest culture warrior, at least bigger than the person that's standing next to you on the debate stage. And you need to have a plan to stop wokeness, whatever that means. Zinkle Asamua is covering Ron DeSantis' latest fight on education. NBC's Ali Vitali is on Capitol Hill following the latest move on the vote to remove Elon Omar from that Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, Zinkley, let's start with what you've learned about 
everything that got changed in this AP African American Studies course that Florida at first deemed unworthy. Yeah, Chuck, so this course is very controversial, AP African American Studies, and DeSantis targeted it last week, saying he would be banning it from the state. And specifically, him and his administration pointed out issues of intersectionality and topics on sexual orientation, saying that they did not pertain to black history. Now, it is important to note that Florida actually requires the teaching of African American history, and Governor DeSantis said he is happy to teach it, however, without those factors and uh, sex of the topic. So this week, the first day of Black History Month, we heard from the College Board. They released an updated curriculum, and many critics, including the ACLU, were upset to find that scholars explicitly named by DeSantis were taken out, as well as topics like black feminism and the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, the College Board has very clearly and firmly said, hey, we did not uh, bow to political pressure. They said this framework was actually finalized back in December, uh, and they say it's not in response to DeSantis. Of course, it's hard to grapple with that when you hear the specific things his administration targeted and what we now see out of this new curriculum, uh, but it has a lot of people talking, and even Ben Crump told us that he intends to sue if Governor DeSantis does not mm. lift this ban, but so far, Chuck, we have not heard from him on this updated framework. And Zickley, I know you were looking more on this and what was going, at, going on in AP classes, but he's also gotten very aggressive at all the state universities. Um, we know he took over one completely, but there's been a lot of pressure being put on the biggest state universities when it comes to diversity programs. What does that look like? Yeah, Chuck, a lot of pressure even just this week. On Tuesday, we got a press release from his administration saying they're looking to prohibit efforts around DE&I. Of course, we're familiar with that terminology, right? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. So this is just one of many efforts that we've seen from Governor DeSantis. He specifically targeted teaching around race, around education. Uh, and so to many, the ban on AP African American history is just sort of the cherry on top of many policies we've seen from this governor. Chuck. Sinclair, uh, really appreciate that reporting down in Florida. It is pretty clear everything he's been doing this week is lining up for what appears to be a national campaign. Let me move over to Congress. Uh, Ali Vitale, we saw Ilan Omar today, and that was, I guess it's the first effort at a whip operation since Kevin McCarthy got the speakership. And they had to work three days to get this vote. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it was quite the effort that was made for a symbolic culture war vote. What a thing to use your whip operation on. But look, this was a moment where technically they wanted to do this yesterday, but because of the slow pace with which these committees have come together, they had to wait to do this vote until today. But nevertheless, we saw people like Congresswoman Sparts and Congressman Buck called into McCarthy's office and whipped in order to get them in line for this vote. Ultimately, the way that it shook out is they were able to get some concessions on what they're calling due process for the future in these instances where Congress might want to kick someone off of a committee, but these members want it to be more bipartisan in nature. McCarthy made that concession to those two members, as well as Congresswoman Nancy Mace. All of them ultimately ended up voting for kicking Ilhan Omar off the Foreign Affairs Committee. And now going forward, we'll see if there's some kind of bipartisan process moving on. But nevertheless, you're right. This really was a moment where it was Republican lawmakers able to make good on threats and demonizations that they've had on the campaign trail of people like Ilhan Omar, of the squad and then yeah. of course it comes after what they did on the intel committee to eric swalwell and adam schiff ali what is have you gotten a consistent answer from republicans as to why they believe she shouldn't serve on house foreign affairs committee they're saying that it's her past comments, specifically the thing that McCarthy has continued to say in his explanations, which is the idea that she talked all about the Benjamins several years ago. Now, these are comments that she has since apologized for, but also, if you remember at the time, which I know you do, Democratic leadership also offered condemnations of that at the time, and so did other members of her conference and caucus. So it's a pretty big distinction between the way that we've seen Democrats when something happens within their ranks the way that they've reacted to it and shown a willingness to condemn people in their party. Whereas with Republicans, we've seen people like Marjorie Taylor Greene yeah. and Paul Gosar not receive any kind of that, that kind of reaction in the way that we saw from Democrats in these instances. So there is an inconsistency. So I'm just curious if you run across any Democrats that in hindsight they wonder if they should have gone down this road with Gosar and Marjorie Taylor Greene? 
Most of the Democrats that I'm talking to are just eyes on the road ahead. I mean, they have made this joke time and again that they are the most unified and happy group of people to be in a minority. We'll see if that continues on as we get deeper into a divided government, because things are already getting pretty acrimonious here in Congress, Chuck. I mean, we knew that divided government was going to be tough, and we knew that the toxicity here between both parties could get messy. But I mean, even just look at the hearings that we saw yesterday devolving into finger pointing over uh, name calling of people uh, as insurrectionists, whether or not there could be guns. That was a debate that you and I talked about yesterday. So we've already seen this sort of start bubbling up, and the fights are only going to get tougher going forward when it gets to things like the debt ceiling and government funding. Ali Vitale and Zinkley Esamwa before that. Thank you both for getting us started on what is a bit of a unique lead for us today. Thanks very much. Joining me now is our panel, USA Today Washington Bureau Chief, Susan Page, Washington Post columnist Eugene Robinson. He's also an NBC News political analyst and Republican strategist Matt Gorman. Uh, this was sort of a topic, frankly, that I thought we, we're all going to see written about more and more as these campaigns get going. But it really just sort of hit today because this morning, this one of Put out something that Marco Rubio put out. He put out his anti-woke agenda, and he had like 15 bills. <laughs> and he said, "Woke ideology has infected every aspect of American life and culture. It is hurting our kids, tearing apart communities, and weakening our military." Susan, if somebody asked you, "Can you explain what woke ideology is?" How would you describe it? Or critical race theory? Yeah. Do you think there's some consensus about that? I think the economy must be doing pretty well <laughs> if transgender <laughs> children are the biggest issue facing that the Congress is facing. But this is, in some ways. This is, it's almost like we've stripped away all of the other parts of the conservative movement, and this is what the entire primary campaign is going to be about? So, it, so the primary campaign may well be about who stands the most aggressively against wokeism, whatever you decide that might be. Does the general election turn into that as well? Is this mm -hmm. a debate that consumes all of America? And is it one that that helps or hurt Republicans if it does. I mean, you'd think it would hurt Republicans because it's not issues that people face right. around the kitchen table. On the other hand, you look at the last Virginia governor's race and the issue of parents' rights delivered the governorship uh, to Glenn Young. Seems like if you can merge it with an issue that matters to folks, you can, you can pull this off. Matt, I will say this as a branding front uh, for conservatives. Has wokeism replaced socialism? Um, like, to, everything seems to be branded to, as woke now. To an extent. I mean, yeah. I, I was at the NRCC in 2018, socialist, you know. You were using it, that a lot more than woke. Uh, more, yeah. yeah. But I, I will also say this. I think it is, does better in a general election than many people give it credit for. It's not just Glenn Youngkin, even though you're right, Virginia's not exactly ruby red. DeSantis with a historic victory mm -hmm. uh, in, in uh, last November. But also, I mean, I was looking this up today. One of the, somebody who called out woke culture just a year or two ago was Barack Obama, to an extent, and he made some waves in the left with that. And, and look, I think you look at a majority, whether it's opposing sex changes for minors, opposing sexual content being taught under third grade, um, and also protecting kind of women's sports, those all have a majority, according to a poll in the last year, of Americans. Okay, okay. but Eugene, what all of everything that Matt just cited are things that I think affect let me see how many zeros here, point zero, 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 zero exactly. like three percent of Americans. Exactly. Like stuff we are that, not debating something that's stuff impacting that either, a lot of Americans. either affects a tiny, tiny number yeah. of Americans or it's actually not happening at all. Right. right. I mean, they're not, you know, teaching, the um, you know, advanced example. sexuality in the first grade. So, no, it's not happening. Um, it, it, since wokeism doesn't actually mean anything specific, it has come, as you said, to be this it's overall a phrase right? that means stuff I don't like, stuff yeah. you don't like. Right. And, it, it, and, and under that brand, um, it, it does have an impact when you talk about education, you talk about parents' rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think just politically, Democrats will need a message on parents' rights and on education because they're going to yeah. get pounded and pounded and pounded on that. But I don't think that's you know, rocket science to do. You know, it's interesting. You brought up Glenn Young, and there's a new Mason Dixon poll today. I want to show it a little bit. He's doing well, and it's certainly more of a, I'd look at this more as mm -hmm. he's doing what most Virginia governors do, is he's in the mid 50s. It's Biden that is in trouble in a place like here when he's sitting at 45. But you know what's interesting here, Matt? I've already had Republican presidential campaigns say, oh, yeah, he. De Watch out for Glenn Young, and we're going to nail him on diversity, equity, and inclusion from his days at Carlisle Group. I'm, I'm astonished at how much this is already becoming 
oppo research fodder, if you will. I mean, uh, as an oppo guy from, from Jeb, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I can appreciate <laughs> yeah. the, 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 at least the thought. Uh, look, I think one of the other things, too, when we talk about Carlisle Group, it, it jogged my memory, I think Republicans, in response to many of the liberal activists on the left kind of drumming up debates and using corporations mm -hmm. as a tool to get, you know, folks on their side, I think, you know, you, what you're seeing now is Republicans being like, with to big business, look, we gave you a lot of what you wanted. We got you tax cuts, we left you alone, and now you're still attacking us. So if well, you're actually, gonna now they're leaving them alone. If, 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 I, if, exactly, no, you're, have, you're right. They, 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 are, learn, they, are, they learn. They're not doing Because it they learn, though, that I, once you enter the political arena, yeah. there's no tapping out. You're in. But every, oh. everything gets caught up in this. I mean, exactly. COVID vaccines and gas stoves are now part of the woke debate, right? How it's does like this happen? They're, they're going to make you give up your vaccines. gas stove. It's all yeah. vaccines. Yeah, all vaccines and That's, gas stoves. Well, mRNA vaccines. This yeah. is yeah. a real idea uh, that someone has introduced, I believe, in a legislature that want to ban any future mRNA vaccines which is, from which is federal funding. Which is insane. State which distribution. Which is insane. This incredible technology that allows, you know, will allow millions but of people this feels to live. <laughs> But this is currency on the right these days, right? You know, I, I, I will think this, and I've said this before, I, I think a Trump made an inherent mistake by not bragging about warp speed. I mean, we talked about this numerous times. Yeah. Hallmark of the You think it becomes a problem for him? I mean, look Do you at, think the vaccine becomes a negative for him in a Republican party? Look at what we've already seen him trying to outflank DeSantis on COVID and his attacks. Yeah. They're not just falling flat. They're just not really making a well, lot of sense. Well, they don't make sense. sense. Yeah. 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 But, the, I mean, I'm not sure whether DeSantis is more clever than everybody else or ham-handed the gas well, stove thing feels like it walks that line exactly. i'm not sure if it's ham look, look, smarter or or over the top i you know i'll go on record i have doubts about desantis as a national candidate and whether that ham-handedness that that dogmatism that stridency plays well on a national stage. Now, we will mm -hmm. see, but he, he would be the most humorless candidate um, to, to, to do well, yeah. I think, in a long, long time. It played pretty well, those very traits, for Donald Trump. And that being, being ham-handed, saying things that seem like they're over some kind of line, and DeSantis offers Republicans that sort of blustery attitude without all the baggage that Trump is yeah, but Yeah, but, but Trump had... This, Trump was an entertainer. Yeah. He was a skilled entertainer, and he knew how to play a crowd. He knew how to play to cameras. I don't know if DeSantis has those skills. I, I will say this, though. We talk about ham-handedness. I mean, we didn't just go to a gas stove and pull us out of nowhere. We had a bureaucrat, mm -hmm. former Richard Trumpka, his son, I'll float this, and so okay. we'll one react. bureaucrat and one agency. But, like, but, like, but it's, he's not—he's not like a no-name guy. And so All again, right. like anybody, I mean, I remember when we were having to answer for state legislators putting out random things. You know, had nothing to do with the federal level when it, I was at the NRCC. Like these are how these things go, and you use them to your advantage, politically. Yeah, but it was—it wasn't like it was in the State of the Union address. My proposal to ban gas stoves. If you don't have a culture war thing to run on, uh -huh. can you can you be successful in this Republican primary, Nikki Haley? Chris Sununu, they don't seem like comfortable candidates playing that card. I think it depends. You, well, I think more than anything, you have to run a race that is true to you. I don't think, I think Nikki Haley can play some of that. I think she's a very credible messenger on that. I think people have forgotten how talented of a candidate she is in these last couple of years when she's kind of been out of sight. I don't think that would be a Sununu play. That doesn't strike me right. as a him or Larry Hogan play. But does she become too woke for getting rid of the Confederate flag now? In South Carolina. But, I mean, I'm not saying I'm not to be snarky. No, no, I'm no. asking a serious question. I, I, I will, Excellent question. I will say this. I, I was... I think the answer to that was the fact that we really haven't heard much about that at all in a negative way. It's right, kind of but an will, we, will we, now that she's well, a candidate for office? But wouldn't you, I, I know only how these things go as you mm -hmm. kind of expose somebody's vulnerabilities and that those first write-ups of their candidacy. Yeah. Well, I know of a former president who was critical of, for example, getting rid of co Confederate names on yeah. bases and yeah. other installations. Speaking of that former he could president, go there. Susan, uh, perhaps the more important news that he made today is when he would not pledge to support the Republican nominee if it's not him. Yeah. If, which if some of the other guys are saying, I'm not sure I'm going to support him if, if it's him. So here we same go. Same thing he said, as he pointed out today, same thing he said in 2016. Yeah, except he wasn't head of the party then. Now yeah, he, he kind of is. You know, the, the, that's one thing I think is notable. I don't know if Trump will be the nominee, but Trump's party is going to be the Republican Party. What, don't you think whichever nominee gets it, whether it's Trump or someone else, they will be following 
the, they will have the Trump characteristics, the Trump attitude toward politics, and the Trump policies. I don't think you can win a primary if you don't, right, Matt? I think it depends. I think it, I think tone was a really dominant issue in 2016, uh, but we didn't know that until later on, right? I think this this thing will have to flesh out a little bit. I think a lot of it will be how DeSantis and Trump fare against each other, because you're right, DeSantis and Trump have a very similar tone, but I also would be surprised if Nikki Haley wins, it's not going to be by, you know, mimicking Trump. It'll be kind yeah. of her own lane. Carrie Lake's going to Iowa. Next week. Not right. making it up. Now, she was born in Iowa. She of went to high course. school. Excuse me. Went to high school in Iowa, went to yeah. college in Iowa, so she has some mm -hmm. family ties. She has family ties. She did lose an election, although she won't acknowledge it. But uh, hey, you know, she thinks she's got star quality and she thinks, why not? Why not? I, 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 I would, I'm old enough to remember when news organizations are claiming people want to run for president. Sounds like Carrie Lake does. I, I, she wants to run for something. I mean, but she's barely governor of Arizona, so why would she want to leave that great job? Maybe she, she, wants, to, yeah. maybe she wants to run for vice president. She wants to run for ah. Senate, I mean, to be really honest, right? She right. knows that Iowa has the media, so she's, instead of trying to camp no, out in she, Arizona and rely... She finds cameras. Yep, she does. No. Cameras find her. Yes. I think, uh, I think it's a match made in heaven. Uh, Susan Eugene and Matt, thank you for this unusual start to the primary season. Coming up, the latest on the fight for police reform. President Biden prepares to meet with leaders of the Congressional Black Caucus in a few minutes. And that will be the main topic. Plus, inside the administration's new plan to try to address the nationwide crisis of homelessness. My interview with the uh, HUD secretary, Marsha Fudge, is ahead. She's talking about money for homelessness in rural America. This is a problem everywhere. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. In just a few minutes, the Congressional Black Caucus is scheduled to meet with President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris on the issue of police reform. The caucus hopes to push the president to help lead reform efforts in the wake of the death of Tyra Nichols. But ahead of the meeting, the White House seemed to put the onus back on Congress. Here's what Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre said. He was very clear when he spoke to uh, Tyree Nichols' uh, family, his, his mother and his stepdad, he said that he was going to do everything that he can uh, to encourage and ask Congress to act. That still stays the same. Now he's meeting with Congressional and Black Caucus to see what can we do? How do we move forward? Sometimes, and this is a reality, we know how Congress works, right? Sometimes it's going to look different. Meanwhile, the police reform legislation that the White House is backing isn't going anywhere in Congress. Today, the top Republican negotiator on the uh, issue of police reform, Senator Tim Scott, tweeted that it was, quote, a non-starter. So where do we go from here? Our chief White House correspondent, Peter Alexander, has the latest ahead of this meeting. So, Peter, obviously the White House is trying to have realistic expectations. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I, I interviewed the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee on Sunday. He's not, he doesn't believe that there needs to be uh, big federal legislation on this. This does feel like this is going nowhere in Congress. Um, how do they say that without letting disappointing people? Well, that's a good question, Chuck. You know, I was trying to drill down on this and that back and forth with Corinne Jean-Pierre, the press secretary, earlier today, because notably we heard uh, during the Tyree Nichols funeral yesterday from Kamala Harris, the vice president, saying that the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, in her words, was non-negotiable. Basically, it had to look like that. Well, everyone realizes that's not going to get passed, certainly with Republicans now controlling the House. It didn't get through the Senate, even with the Democrats having the majority back in 2021. They still have a narrow majority right now. And Corinne Jean-Pierre said to me, you know, we're open to something, quote, different as long as it's done in a bipartisan way. The question is, is there anything that can be done in a bipartisan way on this issue, especially after you showed that quote from Tim Scott saying that the present legislation is a non-starter. So we know the CBC that called for this meeting, that their leader, Stephen Horsford, the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, met earlier um, this week with Susan Rice, the Domestic Policy Council head here at the White House. And basically, according to Horsford, she was open to to hearing some recommendations on what they might be able to do through executive action. But remember, there's only so much that the White House can do through executive action. They already have banned chokeholds for federal law enforcement agencies. They can't do anything more broad than that as it relates to that issue. They've created this national police database. So if a bad officer goes from one uh, state to another, there's a record that tracks them. So you don't just hire a guy who does something awful in one state when he moves to the next. So where does it go from here? The CBC hopes, among other things, the president will really put some muscle behind this, including during the State of the Union to take place next week. Chuck. Well, and I, I guess that's, it sounds like what the CBC is hoping to do is more shape the messaging as opposed to 
have the White House lead this these talks because it, it sounds like the White House is not interested in being the point person on this. I think you're probably right. I think the CBC would like the White House to be more of the point person on this instead of last time around, leaving it up to the negotiators on Capitol Hill. Cory Booker is going to be among those who's here today. Uh, he and Tim Scott were heavily involved in the negotiations, but as evidenced by the way that ended and by what we're hearing from Scott, uh, now it doesn't look like George Floyd Justice and Policing Act's going to go anywhere. So can they get anything done? President Biden was asked that very question at the end of an unrelated event earlier today. He was asked as he exited the East Room, is it possible with this Congress to get police reform done? And he crossed his fingers to the camera and said, I hope so. Chuck. Peter Alexander, uh, reporting from the White House. Peter, thank you. I'm, I'm joined now by Democratic Congressman uh, from Maryland and a member of the Congressional Black Caucus and a veteran of many a congressional fight uh, today and yesterday these days is uh, Kwesi Mfume. Congressman Mfume, it's good to see you. Thank you very much, Chuck. Thanks you know, for having me. I was revising my history. You know, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was not the first Civil Rights Act that a Congress passed, and it wasn't the last Civil Rights Act that Congress passed. And I say this because there's been nine Civil Rights Acts. Is it fair to say that we probably are going to, should we, are we at the point we have to accept that there may be multiple police reforms. And let's see what you do here, and then you may have to come back, and you may have to come back. Is that, that realism set in yet? Well, I think it's always been the case. You do what you can do when you can do it, and you learn how to win and live to fight another day. Um, it's interesting that so many people will characterize uh, the George Floyd Justice Act as a non-starter. Uh, that was the same thing that was said in 1965 with the Voting Rights Act, with the mm -hmm. Public Accommodations Bill, with the Dr. Martin Luther King holiday, with the American with Disabilities Act. So it's a nice way to characterize things, but it doesn't always speak to what the final uh, verdict will be. And that verdict is oftentimes shaped by message, um, by advocacy, and by compromise. So there could be several versions that emerge uh, over time. Right now, I think you have to go in with the, the strongest hand and the strongest position. And Steve Horsford, our, our, our mm -hmm. chairman of the caucus, who is uh, negotiating this with the White House, understands that. We all support him. And I believe that uh, we've not seen the end of this battle. And yes, uh, we want the president to use the bully pulpit. We will fight like hell to do yeah. what we have to do in the Congress to pass it. But any other help we can get, we welcome. Is it your understanding that what separated Karen Bass, uh, Cory Booker, and Tim Scott the last time was simply qualified immunity, or were there other sticking points? Well, yeah, there was one great big sticking point, that there was no willingness on the Senate side to do anything at all. Uh, and so this idea of hiding behind qualified immunity got more attention than anything else. But Karen Bass did everything she could on the House side. Uh, Cory Booker did everything he could do on the Senate side. The sticking point really was Tim Scott and his unwillingness to budge on anything, it seems like, but he certainly hid behind, in my opinion, qualified immunity. We really don't need that. We've got to find a way to have common ground here. And without that, we will just be the same kind of gridlock and didlock that we've always been living with. I, I hate to be a cynic on this, but do you think if he runs for president, that makes it harder to negotiate with Tim Scott? But if he decides not to run for president, that maybe it'll be easier to negotiate on this issue? <laughs> well, you're not being a cynic. You're being a realist. And I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, what's the old phrase? We uh, uh, campaign in poetry, but yeah. we govern in prose. Yep. I think you'll see a different Tim Scott if he gets out there, one that's unwilling to give up on this issue. And if he doesn't run, then there's another bite at the apple for everybody that's trying to make him realize that this is the right way to go. Hey, look, you've been, this is not your first time in Congress. You were head of the NAACP. You've, you've worked all sides of so many of these issues in the past. Is there a smaller bill you think you could get done right now on police reform? You know, one that maybe just created the database uh, across state lines. You know, I mean, my goodness, if we could just tackle wandering cops, right? Like that would be progress. Well, yeah, and I don't want to get ahead of my own leadership on this, except to say uh, that change comes incrementally. And where you can get a victory, you get one. The president set a great example by using his executive order on several of those issues, the creation of the database, 
uh, and, and other things. I think he can go further, uh, perhaps as it relates to no-knock warrants, barring them on a federal level with federal forces. But also, I think in states, there is a huge opportunity here for state legislatures to help start moving this along mm -hmm. and for all of us on the Hill, quite frankly, to kind of find a way to talk, to work our way through this and to make some sense. People want action. We just can't wait for the next situation like this to occur. If you were still head of the NAACP, how would you be handling this situation with the College Board and AP and African American Studies in the state of Florida? Well, I think the College Board, uh, to a large extent, has wimped out uh, in the face of the rhetoric uh, coming from Florida, particularly the Senate. And I'm using the word wimp out. That's my description. I just, when I say that, I mean, I think they could have been stronger here and held their ground. I understand some of the issues with the College Board and what they thought that they had to put forward in order to satisfy their constituency. Uh, but sometimes you just have to push back. And I don't know that enough pushback occurred in this instance. Uh, I believe that history, and we had a big press conference out uh, in front of the Capitol today, uh, history is history, whether it's black history or what we call traditional American history, it's all rolled together. So you just can't say that you're not going to teach it because you don't like it. You know, in Germany, students are made to learn about the Holocaust. Yeah. Uh, students in this country ought to be able to learn about slavery, about the things that were part and parcel of it, both during the time and after the time. And we ought to take a great deal of pride in the fact mm -hmm. that we talk about our history. This was not the best of beginnings for a nation. What we did to Native Americans, the, how we annexed the Hispanic, and how we enslaved the Negroes of those days, those things are real. They have to be taught. So I would just think that uh, the College Board, without me telling them what to do because they don't need my opinion. Right. But they do need the opinion of their larger constituency. I think their larger constituency would argue that you cannot change history by ignoring it. We're here to form a more perfect union. There was a reality that it wasn't perfect at the time. And and there's there's ways to balance all of that. Anyway, Kwesi and Fume, thanks for coming on and sharing your perspective with us. Thank you very much. Up next, as more communities declare homelessness a local emergency, I'm going to talk to the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Marsha Fudge, on how the federal government plans to step in and help, even in rural America these days, there's a homelessness crisis. That's next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. The Biden administration is launching a new initiative to address homelessness in rural communities. The Department of Housing and Urban Development announced today that it was awarding more than $300 million in grants to more than 40 communities nationwide. All of it is part of the administration's effort to reduce all homelessness in this country by 25% by the year 2025. Right now, there are about 600,000 people that are homeless in a single night, according to a recent report. And the likelihood is that we are undercounting, not overcounting. Um, because the goal is really, it's really difficult to keep track of this. But how challenging is this goal? The National Park Service says it plans to clear a homeless camp in McPherson Square. This is just two blocks from the White House, less than two weeks from now. It is the largest encampment in the district. I'm joined now by the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, also a former member of Congress, Marsha Fudge. Secretary Fudge, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Um, I want to talk about why you're in what you're unveiling today, and that is uh, a new initiative to try to address homelessness in rural communities. Um, but obviously, this is an issue that is hitting every community of every size here in the nation's capital. They're about to clear McPherson Square uh, of some uh, of a homeless tent encampment. You're talking about rural communities, mid-sized cities have these tent cities. This is is it fair to call this an epidemic? There's no question but that it's an, it's an epidemic. There is a crisis in this country. Any time, Chuck, that you can say that 500,000 plus people sleep on our streets on any given night, that more than 200,000 of them are unsheltered, it is a crisis. It is an epidemic, and we are in Chicago today not only to give the resources that we know need to be targeted to those populations, but to sound the alarm as well. And I guess that's the question. Um, this is a grant that's targeting rural communities. But as we're discussing, this is, it, it does, every community is dealing with this. Do you have an example of a best practice 
these days where, boy, this community f is figuring this out. Maybe it's the mini houses. Maybe it's creating area. There are some people that would prefer to live in a tent and maybe designating areas. Is there a model out there? I don't think there's I don't think that there's any one size fits all. What we know is that yes, we have communities that are building tiny houses. We have communities that are building container homes. We have communities that are buying motels and hotels and putting uh, unsheltered people in them. The biggest issue though and the reason that we're giving the 60 million dollars to deal with unsheltered as well as rural is so that we can do the kind of outreach. Many people don't have any idea that there is help. And so part of what we're doing is making sure that people can know that there is help to do the kind of outreach we need to do and then to quickly move people into sheltered housing. We try not to, of course, do congregate in, in shelters, but we do have resources where we know that there are people who have buildings that we can house people in. We know that there are places that because of the co the COVID pandemic, yeah. are empty that we can use. There are many resources. People just don't know that they're there. But everybody has to do it the way that fits their community best. Well, I was just going to say, do you believe that this homelessness crisis is is HUD's responsibility or ultimately the responsibility of cities? And you're a partner to assist. Well, I would say that both the president and vice president have made it clear to me that it is an issue that is a priority for them. It is all of our problem, Chuck. Anytime, I'm in Chicago today. Yesterday when I arrived here, it was 11 degrees. Can you imagine what it means for people to be sleeping under bridges? There is no place in this country, there is no place where people should be allowed to sleep on the streets. That means we have failed ourselves because we assume that people who are on the streets are all mentally ill or right. they're on drugs. It is just not the truth. So my job is partially to humanize the face of homelessness, to say that there are single senior citizens who are on the street because they can't afford rent, that there are families with children, there are young people that are aging out of foster care. There are many reasons people are on the street. And as a nation, we need to do better. So yes, is it a local problem? Yes, but when you start talking about a half a million people, it is a national problem as well. One of the things you hear when you talk to mayors about this issue is that there is a portion of this population that doesn't want to go into shelters or doesn't want to go into the system because the system didn't do, maybe they, they think the system is the reason why they're out there, right? So there's a little bit fear of this. How do you convince people to take advantage of these resources? Well, I do talk to mayors every day. As you know, HUD not only does things like address homelessness, but we are the voice of cities in the federal government. That mm -hmm. is what we do. But, but what I think people don't like is they don't have safety in what they call the system. This morning, we were talking with persons who had been formerly uh, homeless. And what they all said to a person is the safety of a place that is mine yeah. where I don't have to worry about sleeping in a shelter where I may be attacked or where I may have to sleep on the floor or, or where I don't know where I'm going to get my next meal. But the stability that comes from housing has changed their outlook. And so I think once we explain to people what we can do and then get them stably housed and start to provide the services that they may need, then they change their tune. And I would say to you, Chuck, most people do not want to live on the street. They, people that. use that as an excuse. Yes, there are some, but by far, the majority of people want to live in a safe, stable home. If there is uh, one magic wand you could go to Congress, you know, it's always interesting to me, you were in the legislative branch a long time. Here you are now in the, in the other branch, and you see how you are using the money that gets appropriated by Congress. If you went back to Congress now, what's the, what's a, What's a more effective way or effective bill you'd be introducing to make your job now as HUD secretary easier? Well, the first thing obviously I do is ask for resources for more low income and moderate income housing and more public housing. You know, some years back, Congress, in its own wisdom, decided that we could not build public housing. We could only replace public housing. 
there are many more people in need today than there were then. So the first thing I do is ask for resources. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I would say to them, Chuck, is that as, as elected officials, as people in the administration, as people in government, we only have one job, and that is to take care of the people we serve. And we are not doing our job when we are allowing hundreds of thousands of people to sleep on our streets. Well, I tell you that what you just said there at the end about the issue of public housing and this idea that we, we don't build new public housing, uh, it's a conversation that I hope uh, we can get started with a lot more people. Secretary Marsha Fudge, really appreciate you coming on uh, and sharing with us what you Thank are doing. Thank you so much for having me. I you appreciate it. it. After the break, the King of Jordan sits down with President Biden at the White House amid rising tensions and violence in his neighborhood, the Middle East and Israel and the West Bank, what it means for the region and the U.S. That's next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. President Biden hosted a private lunch today for Jordanian King Abdullah at the White House. This is King Abdullah's third visit to the White House since President Biden took office, and it comes amid rising tensions in the Middle East. It's hard to say that any visit seems to always come with rising tensions in the Middle East, for what it's worth. But the violence in the region that has spiked lately uh, has been uh, very scary stuff. There was a Palestinian gunman killed seven civilians outside a synagogue in Jerusalem. The Palestinian Authority, meanwhile, is claiming that more than 35 Palestinians were killed in January, mostly during Israeli military raids. Secretary of State Tony Blinken has been in the region recently. He met with both Israeli President Netanyahu and Palestinian Authority President Abbas, trying to urge calm, but was una unable to make progress on de-escalation. Ramadan and Passover are going to coincide we are going to have a very, very tense 60 to 80, 90 days. Joining me now is Lucy Kurtzer, Ellen Bogan. She's the director of the Israel and the Palestinian Territories at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Lucy, thank you for coming in. Of course. Um, I think some, if you're a viewer of this show, you might be numb to the idea there's rising, escalating violence and tension, you know, in the West Bank and the Palestinians and the Israelis. But it does appear to be King Abdullah's message here to America is that Believe it or not, this is going to be worse than you've ever seen. Do you, I mean, that's what he's warning. Do you, do you see the same thing? Yeah, I think this is an incredibly um, fragile time. And, you know, as you mentioned, we're always saying King Abdullah's arriving, you know, the time of rising tensions. I think we said exactly the same thing when he was last here in May. He, he only comes when there's rising <laughs> tensions, <laughs> sadly. Yeah. It's true, and it's probably sadly ironic that we're sitting here on Groundhog Day today talking about this because, right. um, again, we all say we've seen this movie before. People use the term cycle of violence. But there are all sorts of dynamics going on um, that suggest this is really heading... Um, in the wrong and, and um, possibly the irretrievable uh, direction. Who's, you know, it's interesting, the, the lack of faith in the leaders, whether it's Israelis with their fragile governments that, they, that have dissolved multiple times, and Abbas does not necessarily have much of a mandate in the West Bank, does he? He, he has no mandate. Of yeah. course, he's, he's no longer democratically elected. He's going on so many years in the term since, you know, elections of a couple they're of They're petrified ago. to have an election, aren't they? Because they wouldn't win. They're petrified. And in fact, part of the issue is, I think, the last time around when we were about to be on the cusp of, of elections, and I think you had over... Over, well over 90% of um, eligible voters registered. So when those elections were uh, pulled, it, was, um, it just added to the despair that Palestinians feel. You know, you have a population that's very young. So many of those voters, I think a majority, had never had the chance to vote before, yeah. would have been first-time voters. And I think this, this violence that you were talking about, that you're seeing the disintegration in the West Bank, speaks to the lack of control that Abbas now has. There's two new ingredients that we didn't have the... the, the I guess you could argue the last intifada, right? Mm -hmm. The two new ingredients are the most right-wing government that Israel, Israel's ever had yeah. um, and a youth in the Palestinian youth who really feel as hopeless as they have. I mean, a nothing is the way it was described to me. There's a, they got nothing to lose attitude, and that is... You know, Katie, yeah. by the door. You've seen that on display. You know, we often talk, we hear in the context of our own country and others that, you know, attitudes get uh, more liberal the younger the generation is. We know we, we've done, my own organization, U.S. Institute of Peace, we've done a poll with Alliance for Middle East Peace looking at youth attitudes, Israeli and Palestinian, the very youngest cohort, 15 mm -hmm. to 21 years old, a couple of years ago, poll conducted by Dalia Shandlin and Khalil Shikaki. And what we saw is youth attitudes on both sides are far harder line than mm -hmm. their parents and grandparents' generation. Um, real mutual 
not just distrust, but, but zero-sum attitudes toward the conflict, towards each other's presence on the land. Um, the idea of a two-state solution is something that many Americans continue to say in leadership. Yeah. The last president, Donald Trump, did, was sort of shifted away from that. Um, uh, if this goes the way some fear it goes, are we going to basically say that they, the idea of a two-state solution is just not realistic anymore? Well, it, it is hard to see how certainly this gets uh, any easier. And it's interesting, you mentioned Donald Trump. Remember, he had the formulation at one point early on, one state, two state, whatever the parties want. Right. Um, ultimately, there was a plan put forward that was framed somewhat as within mm -hmm. two state nomenclature uh, to some extent. But it's interesting, actually, I think, to listen to the, the Biden administration language on this, because I, I almost think you're hearing something different happening. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely an affirmation that two states is the goal, but actually it's, it's not stated as two states is the goal. It's stated as a formula as our goal is to achieve mm -hmm. equal measures of prosperity, dignity, security, yeah. justice for Israelis and Palestinians, and we believe the best way to get there is through two states. We know why King Abdullah is, obviously cares the region, but I, I, I think there... He, I don't think anybody has a larger Palestinian population in their country other than Jordan and, and Israel. So what, what are, what is he, con obviously, what could, what could impact him domestically if this goes the wrong way? Yeah, I mean, the reason we see King Abdullah coming here every time tensions are rising is because this is truly an existential issue for Jordan. Um, a, uh, a striking proportion of the population uh, is Palestinian, Palestinian origin, refugees from successive... A lot of right-wing Israeli politicians will argue Jordan is Palestine. Right, and that's been out there for a while, right. and I think now, as you mentioned, with this very extreme right-wing government, um, I think there's real concern from King Abdullah that, that that mantra may be coming back. What does de-escalation look like if it happens? Uh, de-escalation, if it happens, it was just wishing uh, Secretary uh, Blinken, before he left, basically said, you know, we're, we're leaving some, um, you know, some of our officials, our team behind to talk about some steps that we have in mind. But ultimately, uh, this is over to you, the parties, uh, to lead. Yeah. We'll share suggestions with you, but then there to support. But, um, but there's a lot of work to be done to see these... Uh, a lot of scar tissues done. between Netanyahu and Abbas as well. And it feels like the old Sharon and... and uh, Arafat days, you just wonder, are they almost tired of talking to each other? Lucy Kurtzer, uh, Ellen Bogan from the U.S. Institute of Peace, thanks for coming on and sharing your expertise. Thank you very much. Let me turn now to another global hotspot, the ongoing war in Ukraine. Yesterday, Ukraine's Minister of Defense issued a stark warning that Russia is preparing to launch a new offensive on February 24th, which is the one-year mark since Russia began its invasion. Ukrainian officials fear that Russia is regrouping and will use this offensive to try to turn the tide of the war. Ukraine estimates that Russia has already mobilized 500,000 troops for this one, almost double the number of troops Putin announced he would mobilize back in September. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, meanwhile, issued his own warning today that Moscow has its own plans to overshadow pro-Ukrainian events commemorating the one-year mark of the war, adding that Russian diplomats were working on something to ensure Western-led events were, quote, not the only ones to gain the world's attention. Interesting that they are worried about a media strategy. We'll be right back with more Meet the Press Now after a quick break. Okay, campers, rise and shine. And don't forget your booties because it's cold out there today. As you may be aware, we talked about it in the last segment. It's Groundhog Day. And what I'm obsessed with is how Groundhog Day, the day, has been completely redefined by Groundhog Day, the movie. Think about it. When someone says the words Groundhog Day... They're rarely talking about the actual Groundhog Day, February 2nd, when Puck Satani Phil comes out of hibernation to tell us if it's an early spring or six more weeks of winter. Sadly, folks, it won't be an early spring this year, at least according to Phil. No, these days, when someone says the words Groundhog Day, they're talking about the idea of reliving something over and over and over again, like Bill Murray does in the movie. Believe it or not, that meaning is now part of the dictionary definition of Groundhog Day. Why is that? Why doesn't Groundhog Day, the day, the tradition, hold up on its own? Well, here's one possible explanation. This is one time where television really fails to capture the true excitement of a large squirrel predicting the weather. So here's a challenge for you, the viewer. Can you think of another example like this, where a term or concept has been totally redefined in the same way Groundhog Day has? So tweet us at Meet the Press using the hashtag MTPNow. If we get some good answers, we might be doing this again. 
at the same time next year. It's only fitting, right? That does it for this hour. I'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues on this Groundhog Day with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.